Hi, I'm so grateful to be back with you again. I want to thank Matt and the session for the invitation to um, preach for you. I wish I was there with you in person so that I could tell you how sorry I am for the way that the floods have ravaged your city um, where I once lived and which I appreciate very much. Um, I'm praying for you and I thank God for the way you're living out your faith in the midst of those difficulties. Our passage today from the Old Testament is from the book of Numbers. It's Numbers chapter 11, and Moses is at the end of his rope. He is leading the Israelites from Egypt to the Promised Land. They're out of Egypt, they're out of slavery, but the Israelites are sick and tired of manna, and Moses is sick and tired of them. So God promises that if he takes them away from the camp, if he takes the elders away from the camp, that God will send his spirit on them. Here's God's word to us from Numbers chapter 11, verses 16 and 17, and then 24 through 30. The Lord said to Moses, bring me 70 of Israel's elders who are known to you as leaders and officials among the people. Have them come to the tent of meeting that they may stand there with you. And I will come down and speak with you there, and I will take some of the power of the Spirit that is on you and put it on them. They will share the burden of the people with you so that you will not have to carry it alone. Moses went out and told the people what the Lord had said, and he brought together 70 of their elders and had them stand around the tent. Then the Lord came down in the cloud and spoke with him. And he took some of the power of the spirit that was on him, on Moses, and put it on the 70 elders. When the spirit rested on them, they prophesied. But they did not do it again. However, two men whose names were Eldad and Medad remained in the camp. They were listed among the elders, but they did not go out to the tent Yet the Spirit also rested on them, and they prophesied in the camp. A young man ran and told Moses, Eldad and Medad are prophesying in the camp. And Joshua, son of Nun, who had been Moses' aide since youth, spoke up and said, Moses, my Lord, stop them. But Moses replied, Are you jealous for my sake? I wish that all the Lord's people were prophets and that the Lord would put his spirit on them. Then Moses and the elders returned to the camp. Amen. Just for kicks the other day, I decided to put into the Google search engine, why are Presbyterians and just see what would happen. You know, you can um, type something in like that into Google and it goes through all the other questions that anyone has ever asked and it tries to anticipate what your question is. And of all the different things that anyone has asked about what, why are Presbyterians, the answer that it gave me was, why are Presbyterians called the frozen chosen? It's a pretty good question, even if it's odd to me that it's the very first thing that comes up. I would like to tell you that the reason we're called the frozen chosen is because we're chosen by God to serve him in the world. And we're called frozen because we descend from the church in Scotland and it's cold in Scotland and sometimes the water freezes in Scotland. But Matt told me not to lie to you. So as much as I'd like to tell you that's why we're called the frozen chosen, I think is actually a lot more likely because if you made the mistake of putting motion sensor lights on in our sanctuary during worship, the sanctuary would usually stay dark because we sit so quietly and so studiously and so um, controlled in what we do. We Presbyterians are not so good at having a lively faith. We are not so good about taking what we understand to be true and living it out. We're not so good to taking, getting off of our feet and taking our faith out into the streets. 
that's why they call us the frozen and chosen. We do everything decently and in order. But the problem with doing everything decently and in order and being the frozen chosen is that sometimes we miss out on the fact that God is not doing things so decently and in order. God sometimes surprises us and leads us places that we don't want to go. I mean, think about the Pentecost passage today. Today is Pentecost. It's the day we celebrate the Holy Spirit coming on that church in Acts 2, that passage that Matt read earlier where the spirit comes with tongues of fire and rushes of wind and people do things they never expected to do. The Holy Spirit is way outside of the box. There, God is moving in ways they don't expect it. And so God isn't so decently doing things so decently and in order. Or take our passage from the book of Numbers. It's one of my favorite passages. God is trying to help Moses, wants to help Moses with the burden that Moses feels. And he tells Moses to take 70 elders out from the camp and up to the tent of meeting. And so that's exactly what Moses does. He takes 70 elders, not 69 elders, not 71 elders, 70 elders. He takes them up to the tent of meeting and then God promises to spread some spirit. And that's what happened. God keeps his promise to the elders. There's only one problem, Eldad and Medad. And as if Eldad and Medad's names are not bad enough, they are supposed to be out in the tent of meeting because they're elders, but they stay back in the camp. Now, the Bible doesn't tell us why they stay back in the camp instead of going to that meeting of elders. I can only imagine that the last thing they want to do is go to another committee meeting. I can almost hear Eldad saying to Medad, the last place the Holy Spirit is going to show up is at a session meeting. So for whatever reason, Eldad and Medad are not doing things decently and in order. They're supposed to go up and out to the tent of meeting, but they stay back home. The thing is, Eldad and Medad are not the only ones doing things out of order because the Holy Spirit, who is only supposed to come to the elders that are out at the tent of meeting, comes and lands on them too. The Holy Spirit's only supposed to come on 70 elders, but we get not one, but two bonus elders out of the deal. And the Holy Spirit's only supposed to go to the tent of meeting, but Eldad and Medad are back in the camp and the Holy Spirit is coming there. Whoa, whoa, the Holy Spirit's doing all sorts of things that is way out of the box for what they expected and for what God had promised. And of course, not everyone is that excited about it. The most faithful kid in the youth group Maybe the most annoying kid in the youth group, you know, the one, he goes and tells Moses, Eldad and Medad are prophesying out in the camp. And then Joshua, the Moses' heir apparent, Joshua, who ought to know better, but Joshua, who does things apparently only decently and only in order, comes and tells Moses, my Lord, stop the spirit. Well, by this time, Moses has a better understanding of what's going on, and here's what he says. I wish that all the Lord's people were prophets and that the Lord would put his spirit on them. Moses is saying, blow, spirit, blow. It's okay if it's on 72 instead of 70 elders. It's okay if it's on the camp instead of the tent of meeting. Blow, spirit, blow, because... You're going to blow anyway. You're going to do whatever you want, Holy Spirit. You're going to send us places we never thought we would go. So blow, Spirit, blow. Now, if that kid and Joshua were proto-Presbyterians, I mean, Presbyterians weren't around back then, but those two, they would have made great Presbyterians. Wait, the Holy Spirit is on the move. Stop, stop, stop. We're frozen. Stop. So they were proto-Presbyterians, but the thing is, most of us are the real thing. Though we might not want to admit it. After all, this 
passage has a real challenge to those of us who like to think we can control everything that happens, who like to do things decently and in order, who like to think about themselves as the frozen chosen. See, sometimes we think we can tell God exactly, we can tell exactly where God's going to work and where God is not going to work. Sometimes we think we can sit back lethargically and let the Spirit do whatever the Spirit's doing and think that we're not part of it at all. Sometimes we think we know better than God what it means for us to live out our faith because we've always lived it out in a certain way in the past. Sometimes I think we get what I like to call the decently and in order disorder. This disorder tries to shackle the Holy Spirit. It tries to put God in a box, and not just God, it tries to put us in a box, saying that we know exactly how and when and where and why we should live out our faith. The decently and in order disorder keeps us from doing things that would make us faithful. The decently and in order disorder keeps us from working for justice, from speaking the good news, from caring for our neighbors. The decently and in order disorder seduces us into thinking that we should be like Aaron and that kid saying, my Lord, stop the spirit. Instead of being like Moses saying, oh, I pray that God would send his spirit everywhere. The decently and in order disorder can shackle us and undermine our faith, but I know also that the Holy Spirit can defeat it. I know that's the case because I've seen it there in Midland. I have lots of friends who live in Midland. I've been watching on Facebook what's been going on in your community since the floods, and I have seen how you have reached out to each other, how you have sought to love your neighbor, the things that you as individuals have done, the thing that Memorial as a church have done. You know, it would be so much easier to be like Aaron and that kid and just say, I'm not going to worry about what's going on in the world. Stop the spirit. The spirit's not going to call me to do anything different, to do anything different than I have before. But instead, what you've done has been like Moses and say, oh, that the spirit would fall on all of us, that we would be equipped to go out and serve our neighbors and love our neighbors. With the pandemic going on and the flood, it would have been so easy to sit back and ignore the whole problem. But you have reached out in your faith and you are not captive to the decently and in order disorder. You haven't just been the frozen chosen. You have been the ones the Spirit has sent out in Jesus' name to love your neighbor. I'm guessing that your primary focus over the last week and a half has been responding to the flood, but if you've had the chance to watch the news, you have seen that that our country has been rent apart over the last week or so over issues of racial injustice and health. The pandemic has made it so obvious about the disparities between the health care and the health that white people have compared to people of, country, of color in our country. We've seen, because of the pandemic, we've seen that um, African Americans, Hispanics, people of color, that um, because probably because they are so much more uh, more often in poverty than white people are, and they have so much less access to health care, that the pandemic has impacted those communities so much greater than the communities that most of us are a part of. In fact, in Michigan, I checked the statistics, and although African Americans are 14% of the population of Michigan, 31% of the people in Michigan who have died from the pandemic are African-American, more than twice as many as ought to have died. And of course, other states' ratio, their ratios are very similar to Michigan's. And so I wonder what, what we decently and in order types might do beyond just bemoan the statistics. I mean, what would it mean for the Holy Spirit to warm up our frozen, chosen hearts and lead us to take concrete steps that our brothers and sisters, our siblings of color, would receive the same kind of health care that 
most of us take advantage of. I mean, what if like Moses, we prayed that the Spirit would come on everyone and that we would learn what these concrete steps are, that everyone would experience the flourishing life that Jesus wants for us. Of course, it hasn't just been in public health. We've also seen in the last couple of weeks so many heart-stopping tragedies of racial injustice and violence. Just last week, we saw African-American George Floyd, his grotesque death under the knee of a white police officer. And of course, this was only one of three deaths that were brought to our attention this past week. And of course, if we go back in time, we see again and again and again examples of this kind of racial injustice. If you have not seen what Matt posted on Facebook, where he transcribed George Floyd's last words, I'm gonna encourage you to check that out. It is heartbreaking, but it is necessary to read them. I'm going to read you just a few things that George Floyd said in his last five minutes of life. Please, please, I can't breathe. Please, man, I am about to die. Please, your knee on my neck. I can't breathe. I'm through. Everything hurts. I can't breathe, officer. You're going to kill me. I can't breathe. The Holy Spirit equips us to work on behalf of the powerless and oppressed. The Holy Spirit warms us up from being the frozen chosen. The Holy Spirit breaks apart the decently and in order disorder. The Holy Spirit sends us out in Jesus' name to love our neighbors and work for justice. Let us call on that spirit now, like Moses, that he would fall on each one of us. Let us pray. Oh God, you send your spirit on us, warm up our frozen hearts, break open our desire to be decent and orderly when it prevents us from working for justice. Break our hearts, O oh God, the way that yours is breaking. We pray in Christ's name. Amen.